welcome everyone. My name is Xander Sprague and I'm your host for Epic Begins with One Step Forward. And today we are having an epic conversation with Kelly Preen. What? Who? Whoa. That's happening. Let's do this. <laughs> Absolutely. So just to give you a little background, I've known Kelly for well, more years than Kelly and I are actually going to admit, but we know right, each other right. from, from, from college. And I went to Pitzer College, Kelly went to Pomona, and Kelly is a force. And I... When we went to school, even though we went to different schools, all the schools are right there next to each other. So as much time as I spent at Pomona, I spent at, at Pitzer doing Without a Box, hanging out with a bunch of my Pitzer friends. There's an all-women's college called Scripps that I was trying to spend time at. <laughs> you know, I really didn't come into my own until after college. But yeah, man, the, the, our college experience was, it was fantastic and we got to know each other. And it, it has been a, in a minute. But we're looking, we're holding up. We're looking good, I like to think. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to believe that. I, I got to say that if I got carted and go to go in a bar and they say, sorry, you can't come in, I'd actually believe that because I myself have a hard time believing the number that's actually attached to me right now. Yeah, yeah, I know it. I know it. And I know you're rocking the dome. I love it. Usually I do too, but this is my, I've been letting it go since the uh, pandemic. So I call this my stay at from. <laughs> it's good. I'm going to try to let it go. I can't lie to you. There, Every other day, I'm like, I got to cut it. It looks like I got buckwheat in a headlock, and I, but I'm going to try to keep it. I'm, I'm going to try to go with it. I'm going to use it for a, a character or you know, something because it, it takes seconds to cut and months to grow. So it you does. Know, I'll probably look like you very soon when I get my next job. It, 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 it is looking good. Oh, yeah, natural. I'll take that. Oh, natural. So, Kelly, just – maybe share with our listeners just kind of a brief history of who is Kelly Preen and what's your career been? Because it's... How, how, how far back do you want me to go? I, look, I'll give you just a group of, you know, quick background of like... Yeah, yeah. I'm originally from, you know, Pennsylvania, State College. My dad taught at Penn State. And so my dad was a professor of adolescent psychology, but he also did musical theater. So I have been on the stage acting, singing, uh, dancing, doing all that since, since I was four, since I was five. But it was, I wasn't here in Hollywood, I was here there in Pennsylvania. So it wasn't what, like I was a Hollywood ki kid chasing Hollywood dreams. I was a central Pennsylvania kid. <laughs> doing, doing community theater doing and happy for it. Theater with 27 old people in there. And, but it was, I, what did I know? It, it, it was awesome. And I knew very young that I loved the attention, both positive and negative. And if I couldn't get it positive, <laughs> I feel you. But that's the beautiful thing about the theater. You, you get that immediate reaction, you get that, that feedback, you get that attention. And I always liked the interaction. I was a class clown. I wasn't like bad in school in that I was stabbing kids in the bathroom, but I was talkative. I'd like, I like to be the, the focus of attention. And so I grew up doing a lot of theater, went to high school outside of Chicago, where I continued to do theater, went to a place called Lake Forest Academy. Yeah. And so in my senior year, my parents had moved to San Diego. When I was looking at colleges, I was looking at schools all in California. So I looked at the Claremont Colleges, looked at Pitzer, looked at Pomona, looked at Stanford, looked at a number of different schools. But when I got into Pomona, I'm like, all right, that's it. Yeah. Here we go. And so it, it, going to Pomona was fantastic because what it, what it did was it was small enough for me to get around and get to know everybody. Because where I went to high school, I was one of 72 in my graduating class. We had... 10 kids, 14 kids in a class. And I remember my freshman year in Pomona, there was like 70 kids in a physics class. And I'm like, what the, what the hell are you all? Get out of the room. <laughs> Can't learn with this many, God, get out. And I also remember I came from Chicago and you know, went to boarding school, shirt and tie every day. Oh yeah, same, I, same, same thing. So I, I came to California, one. went to school and people were like in flip flops and shorts. I'm like, you can't. You can't learn in flip flops. Go put on some, go to put on some, some penny loafers, goddamn. But so by the second year, I'm in a tank top, I'm in flip flops, I got my Birkenstocks. <laughs> it takes no time uh, at all to get uh, acquainted with the California weather and the California, for your lifestyle. But coming here to California to Pomona, I started doing a lot of improv comedy, and I was in a troupe called Without a Box, which I was one of the founding members. Yeah, I got a funny and, story uh, about that. Yeah, no, we had a great time doing improv. And that's just where I just became uh, aware and felt comfortable enough to take strong chances 
in theater and in life, because in, in improv, you, there's, a, there's a saying you say, yes, and. You never deny, you always heighten it. You take it to the next thing. So, yeah. so you have to listen very intently to see what the person you're interacting with is saying, and you have to add on to it. And you can't be timid, you can't be shy. And that really, that improv training helped me greatly as I started to also develop as an actor who had to make strong choices, who had to read the script, who had to break down text and, and come up with what I thought was the character's angle, the, the, the character's take. Yeah. and go for it. I believe in acting that there's really no, there's no bad choices. I think there are weak choices. There's unjustified choices. But if you study the text and you get the material and you can justify the choice you make and do it full force, it might not be the direction, say, the director wanted to go with that, but he'll, he'll redirect you to what it is. And it'll show both that you know how to be directed and also that you know how to take initiative. And so as we start talking about the whole concept of epic and being epic and going after things, the, the ability to take the initiative to start when everybody tells you not to start to, it'll, it'll never happen. You'll never make it. You, you have to find a way. And I'll jump around a lot about different philosophies and things, but you, you have to find a way to let those voices that tell you can't do something or shouldn't do something or shouldn't uh, audition for the play because you're only a freshman or you shouldn't take that leap of faith because no one else has done it. You got to silence those voices and you got to get rid of the friends and the people that are those voices. You got to love them, but you got to surround yourself by the other voices, the other folks that say, let's try, you know, let's, let's, let's go after it. Oh, absolutely. And you were talking about without a box, which was fabulous. And I actually auditioned for without a box. Oh yeah. But, and here, this is a funny story. I had all of the luck as I got up there to do improv. Who was my improv partner but Max Brooks, the son oh, of- yeah. Mel Brooks' son, Max Brooks. Yeah, so that's kind so, of- So, I don't know. I, I, I got the feeling after that not as successful uh, audition that perhaps- there is a comedy gene in that it is passed from generation to generation because well, you know, Max maybe was so. brilliant, so funny, but oh my God, like he, I, was, he was at 78 and I was going at 33. Yeah, yeah. I think he was, a, he was a freshman or something when I was a senior, so I really didn't yeah. get a chance to interact with him too much. But yeah, I don't know if necessarily there's a comedy gene. There can be, same way as we see a lot of actors come in who have a family lineage. I do believe though, that if you're from a family that you watch, again, your parents make strong choices, take criticism and let it roll off of them. Some jokes land, some jokes don't, but you come back in with your next one. If you are raised that way over and over again, the, there's a sense of, again, fearlessness that whatever you do, whatever joke you put out there, is that they, they, they can't kill me. <laughs> the joke bombed, but so the what? They can't kill me for yeah. having a bad performance, for not telling a good joke, for having a bad set, for having a bad show. So that, no matter where that gene comes from, whether or not it's passed down from your father, who is Nell Brooks, or just from a, a coach that w believed in you, a teacher that believed in you, wherever that gene that you believe in yourself comes from, I, I believe it's mandatory to have. And I think that if you look at through lines of people that are successful, some people become successful at 25, some people become successful at 70. At some point they acquire that gene that says, it, I'm going after it and no is not an option. So wherever you get it from, be it your parents, be it from yourself, you can be born with that confidence. You have to have it, you, you have to get it, I don't, beg, borrow, or steal, but become confident and believe in yourself. I don't know how you go to therapy. I mean, I guess I, here I am launching a, a speaking career during a pandemic, so. Yeah, yeah, you have no right to do that. Why did you, why did you call me? The thing, oh, no, you the, so thing the thing I wanna do is fill a room with people and I can't do it, because <laughs> we're not allowed to do it. But. Again, not stopping me. And I do think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying that those, some of that is just being comfortable like in front of a crowd. I know I love nothing more than getting up in front of people and doing a speech, doing a performance. Yeah. Like you, 
I love the attention. I crave the attention. I've, I've often said that my biggest high I, is when I get to speak in front of people. Yeah. And that audience interaction, one of the most challenging parts of what I'm doing is yeah, I've done podcasts and stuff. When I'm just speaking into a mic, it is so much harder, even though I can speak really well, because I don't have the audience to to play off of. Now, I know that, that Kelly, you've been a very successful uh, actor on in movies and, and on TV. And here's a question for you. When you're, when you're, in a production TV or, or movie, are you playing off of the crew? Because they obviously have to be quiet, but if you're doing something that's funny, you... A lot of my career has been doing sitcoms. I, I can talk about some dramatic stuff later, but right. I'll focus on some of the sitcom stuff. So sure. a lot of people have been looking at me like, okay, how do I know him? I got my first, and I'd work up to your answer by telling you that- That's fine. My first, a, out of college, I went to University of California, Irvine, and I got a master's in drama. So I went and I studied my craft. And I think that's part of people's success in Epic Journey is that you become a craftsman at your trade. And, and I don't look at my career or my cr trade as a hobby that right. I lucked into. I look at it as my vocation. I could have been a doctor if I wanted to. I didn't want to. I wanted to do this. So I got myself as good as I could be at that. Right. We'll talk about comedy, but I also did improv. But then when I got out of college, I tried stand up. And you talk about talking on the mic, yeah. uh, being around, you talk. But stand up, you're dealing with the crowd, but you're pretty much, it's you. Oh, it's, there's no doubt. I've done stand up too, and it is woo, crickets, let me it, tell it, you. It's crickets, man. And it, even in improv, you're like, hey, uh, give me a location, give me a relationship. In stand up, it's just you like, hey, who's uh, been on a plane before? Yeah. <laughs> no one in the room. So <laughs> yeah. you're up there by yourself and sure you feed off of the energy uh, of the crowd, but you better have your material. You better have your chops. And again, stand up comedy is a vocation. And I was great at improv. I did stand up, not because I wanted to be a stand up comedian, uh, but because I thought that's how they were handing comedians their shows. Yeah. And to some degree, they still do see comedians as a fast track to a, to a television sitcom deal, because what a comedian has to do is he has to let you know very quickly what their perspective is. I'm a short Jewish woman who grew up in New York. And so that lets you know what you're allowed to laugh at right. when they, hey, I'm a this short black kid from central Pennsylvania who was picked, whatever. They can now laugh at whatever stories that you tell. But again, that's about perspective. And so when we talk about playing off the crowd, Stand-up wasn't necessarily my thing. I didn't want to spend every night at comedy clubs for five hours a night, which I believe you would have to do if that's your vocation and that's how you wanted to succeed at it. Oh, absolutely. I did not want to be a stand-up. I want to be an actor. So I focused my uh, attention on getting more acting gigs, doing plays, doing showcases, that type of thing. So I got my first big break of two lines on the Drew Carey show. So I came in to play a, a process server who serves Drew a, uh, a subpoena because he's been, he's in a sexual assault claim. Right. Um, the, the episode was, he put up a, a cartoon of a caterpillar making love to a crinkly cut French fry. Uh. And some of the women thought that it was in office and so they sued Drew and I was a process server. So I came in, I did two lines. That was my job. My job was to hit my mark. My yeah. job was to lay down the bunt. My job was to move the runners and then go back into the dugout. Yeah. That, that was my job. But I was on time. I knew my lines. I was friendly. You didn't have to bang on the trailer door to get me out. And it was fantastic. And you talk about sitcoms, live studio audiences. That's an opportunity where you do have a chance to play off of the, the producers are laughing and the crew can laugh. And right. people can laugh. And then, and then if it's live, the audience laughs. So you feed off of that energy. And a lot of things have been moving away from live studio audiences. Now, with COVID, you can't really have the studios now. But in the, back in the day, I did a number of shows that were shot in front of a live studio audience. And you definitely do feed off the crowd. Feed off of the, the gaffers, the, the production team, the producers, right. the writers. They're, they're all allowed to laugh. And a lot of times, if they're not laughing, 
<laughs> there's, there's something wrong. Yeah, no doubt. If you're not laughing, then you see them huddle in the side. And then they look at you, then they go back. You're like, oh, <laughs> fuck, what did I do? So, so in terms of a part of an epic story, those two lines became four lines. They brought me back as, hey, let's bring him back as Chuck the security guard. So I was Chuck the security guard, and two episodes became four episodes. Four lines became eight. It became, I'm now in 14, 15 shows per season. Uh, I get to know the cast. I get to like, go with Drew and the crew when they go to Vegas. And we still, so that's a small, epic little stair step story. That's awesome. Yeah, about trying to answer your question about whether or not you can feed off of the, the energy. Because even if it's a comedy or it's like I say, it's a single camera and they can't laugh, you can tell if the energy is excited and they want to laugh. Because a lot of times after they say cut, they just start cracking up. Because they, they can't laugh just for audio reasons, because there's other stuff they have to do. It's not like a studio audience where they're going to dub in and even sweeten the laughs. Yeah. And they have to be quiet so that the sound mixer can do his thing later. But right. you can feed off of the energy. There's In every performance space, and I'm sure you can speak to it too, in every performance platform, there's an energy, a collective energy of the actors you're working with, the crew, the directors, everybody. And I've been lucky enough to have most of the experiences that I've been part of. The energy is nothing but positive and, and supportive. Absolutely. And I, I, I want to let people know that through the years, I'll be watching TV and all of a sudden there's Kelly and be it on, I was, I, I told Kelly this story last week, which was, I was, I've been rewatching ER and all of a sudden there's Kelly as a med student. And I was like, oh my God, there's Kelly. And it's, I have to say for me, super cool to say, there's someone I know, and not just, oh, Kelly went to Pomona and I knew who he was. Uh, obviously, Kelly knows who I am. If I ran into Kelly on the street, he wouldn't be like, you, you went to Pitzer? Uh, oh, okay, yeah, you know. I'm sure we partied together once or twice, Z. Yeah. We, yeah, we probably, yeah, we were in some of the same parties. We, we knew each other. We did. No, absolutely. And it's, it is really cool to see see people that, that you know and see the success that they're having. And Kelly, I know, again, from, as you said, two lines became 12 episodes, 14 episodes. And from there, you, and that is the way that my understanding that in you know, like acting careers begin. I've been watching, I love MASH, like re-watching MASH. And the number of people that were on there that we look at now and go, oh my gosh, there's- there, Yeah, there's- Ron, I mean, I, I there, there, There's Ron Howard, there's- And how people like, like, like you played one part and then they brought him back. So for example, yeah. Harry Morgan, who played Sherman Potter, was in like season one played like this crazy general who was like old and losing his mind. And then they bring him back a couple seasons later to be one of the main cast members. That's you know, really funny. Yeah, and there's a couple things that you touched on there that I'll try to weave in. The, I've been in this career now 26 years, not necessarily to age myself. And I've done, started with Drew Carey show. Then I did a show for a good long time called uh, One on One, where I played Dwayne O'Dell Knotts. Did that for about four years. Before that, I did a show called Between Brothers with me and Tommy Davidson, Kadeem Hardison. Yeah. Uh, that only lasts a season. I did that. Did sh- the Parenthood. Then I did everything from ER, Mad About You, Seinfeld, Living Single, Providence. I just got off a show uh, on Nickelodeon called Night Squad. So depending on what color you are, what age you are, what, you yeah. know, black people know me from One on One and Between Brothers. Yeah. You know, some white folks know me from Drew Carey Show and, and Seinfeld. Yeah. Uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of parents know me from Night Squad and a lot of the stuff I did on Disney. And I'm like, look, I, or Santa I, Hunter. I'm, you glad know? You, I'm glad you're right. And after all that time, after 26 years, I'm still what I call a that guy. Yeah. Um, because if you look at me, you're like, hey, well, how do I, I know that guy, but I don't know exactly what I know him from, like I said. And so I'll be walking past people and I can see them look and I can see them do a double take and go, well, was that? Because I can't quite put it together where they know me from. And if they do stop me, they're like, how do, how do I know? Do you go to my church? Do you owe me $7? How do I? know you and so i'll go drew carey show one-on-one no between brothers no that one seinfeld episode yes yeah 
And so you talk about me, I am blessed. I had a 26 year career in Hollywood, but most of the people that you are talking to or seeing this probably don't know my name. And that's fantastic. That's okay. Cause I've lived a fantastic, I've done, I'm not planning on dying. <laughs> I ain't done, Xander. Don't die yet. <laughs>